eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Cast your burden on the Lord, and God will sustain you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. We have gathered here this afternoon to remember George, to give thanks for his life, to ponder the mystery of death, and to commend George into God's everlasting care. And part of the service at George's, even we knew he was one of Eucharist, right? We didn't even have to check about that. That we celebrate Holy Communion. We are nourished around this altar, around which George and Jean for so many years were nourished. Everybody without exception is welcome to receive Holy Communion. Even if it's not your perhaps usual custom, you might think about it this afternoon because when we receive that sacrament, it connects us not just to God, but to those who have gone before us. And we gather here today, we celebrate Holy Communion, trusting that George is now at that eternal feast, at that heavenly banquet. We'll follow very closely this order of worship. I won't be announcing when things are going to be happening. You should be able to follow it all here. The only other book you'll need is the larger of the two in front of you, the hymnal 1982. We'll have tributes from a friend, from uh, a son, and from a grandchild. And we have readings that were selected by George. As we stand, let us pray. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to life, grant that your servant George, being raised with him, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. First hymn, 560, come down, O brother.
Jeff, other members of the Sullivan family, the Sutherland family, and friends of George. My name is Maynard Goldman, and my wife Suzanne and I have been living at Eastman, at property at Eastman, for over 40 years. Uh, during that time, we came to know George and Jeannie, and uh, I am honored to be here today to say a few words. Those of you who know me may know that a few words <laughs> is not easy for me, uh, but I will do my best to get you out before dark, <laughs> and if you're going to watch the professional football game tonight, I can assure you, you will be home. <laughs> George Drew Sutherland was both a gentle man and a gentleman. George was from the old school, I can tell you that. Uh, myself, a serious person, but with an unexpected sense of playfulness and imagination when it came to interacting with his three children and grandchildren in their formative years. He also had earned a new title in recent years as a great-grandfather to Eli and Julia. We all remember George with those flashing eyes, a quick smile, and that muscle in his cheek that twitched when he was annoyed. <laughs> Born in 1931, he grew up in Winona, New Jersey, graduated from Westfield High, um, and took a couple of years in the Army um, during the Korean War. Fortunately, he was stationed in Germany. And in 1956, he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania on the uh, GI Bill. Shortly after graduation, George was offered a job at Connecticut General, um, where he climbed the corporate ladder, one of those people who worked for one company for his entire career. He was there over 30 years, wound up as executive director of marketing, uh, and several years after the merger between Connecticut General and INA, which became Cigna, he took early retirement. While this was happening, George had married Jeannie, uh, in 1958, and they raised their three children in Bloomfield, Connecticut, Glenn, Julie, and Beth. Their marriage lasted 57 years and ended with Jean's untimely passing. Shortly after he retired, he became a consultant to the Episcopal Diocese of Hartford, a relationship with the church that lasted throughout his life. Devotion to his church and his faith was a very important factor in his deep and abiding community service. This need to give back was ingrained in him and he shared it with Jean. George and Jean built their home in Eastman in 1994. Actually, Jeannie designed the house. George became active in the community, eventually wound up chairing the environmental the ECC, a group which controlled who could build what and where, but perhaps more importantly, who could cut down which trees. <laughs> that was the most important. George reminded me many times that he got many more phone calls as chair of the ECC than he did as board president. My first recollection of George actually was at a board meeting. Uh, when I had just been elected and George was being sworn in as president. At that time, it was a two-year term. Shortly thereafter, we had our first dinner with the ladies, and that was the beginning of our beautiful relationship. Subsequently, George and I had the first of many dozens of lunches over the years. I didn't realize at that time that George had many lunch groups. I don't know how he stayed so fit. <laughs> and uh, not only lunch group, 
groups, but he had study groups that he belonged to here in New London and elsewhere. Uh, he was constantly involved uh, in, in various groups and participating with all kinds of, of folks. One of my favorite in, uh, memories is a book club uh, that we formed with the Sutherlands, the Noisies, and the Fridays. We met quarterly, not just to discuss the book, but to sample various culinary delights, <laughs> uh, a wine choice, and I must add, uh, some other adult beverages. Um, George's favorite was either an old fashioned or a Manhattan, but I remember very well that I kept a bottle of, uh, uh, we kept a bottle of maraschino cherries in the refrigerator for George's drink should he come by uh, late in the, the afternoon. And George was kind enough to have a bottle of Grey Goose in the freezer in the event I stumbled into his home <laughs> late in the afternoon. In reminiscing about their dad, the Sutherland clan focused on his devotion to them both individually and collectively. Glenn fondly remembered hikes in the woods, including on the Appalachian Trail, on Mount Washington, golf outings, and the like. Beth recalled summers at Popham Beach in Maine, and later in Nantucket. Julie talked about Friday nights in the neighborhood, where the kids and families gathered to eat and play games, be a monster and knife, I wish I had been there for that, the island game, and recorded interviews that George did with his kids on tape, which she tells me she still has. On a particular occasion, the noise level exceeded expectations, and Jeannie told people to calm down. But George interjected and rejoined, we are making a memory. And so they were. In addition to community governance and the book club, George and I had another special connection. He was involved in the formation of Iliad, which is the forerunner of Osher at Dartmouth. My involvement didn't begin until 2014. But I was honored to have George opt to take some of my classes. He always asked the best questions. I could tell. <laughs> and he often came by the house with articles in between classes to be sure that I had these in my hand <laughs> when the class uh, was underway. A few brief anecdotes, I think, say a lot about George's character. George and I were both inveterate walkers. Famously at Eastman, George walked all 42 miles of roads twice uh, while he was there. He wanted to be sure that he knew every nook and cranny of the association. It, it turns out that when uh, they were living in, in Connecticut, the family, they had a dog whose nickname was JJ. And George would go out every night uh, after dinner and walk with the dog uh, around the neighborhood, I'm told, a distance of perhaps somewhere between three and four miles. Well, as the years went on, everybody got older, including the dog. And uh, it, it came to a point where the dog couldn't do the walk, and so the dog would walk down the driveway and wait for George to come <laughs> Well, uh, things got even worse with the dog, who was ill, and uh, Jeannie and George decided they had to do what they had to do. So the last night uh, before they put the dog, the dog down, George carried JJ on the entire walk. <laughs> Uh, another, uh, I think, uh, very interesting uh, piece is that I didn't know that George had volunteered to be a mentor in a prison release program when he was down in, uh, in Connecticut. And he had
had a number of uh, inmates who he mentored. It turns out that one of these uh, inmates uh, was actually in jail for killing someone in a bar fight. Um, and as his release date got closer, uh, he was talking to George about his concerns about getting out and uh, worried that he wasn't going to be able to kind of uh, get back into society. George tried to assure him that things were going to be okay. But unfortunately, after his release, he did commit suicide. George tracked down his family and worked with them over a period of some months uh, in an effort to assuage uh, their sorrow uh, during this time. Those of you who live in Eastman may know or may simply have passed by a beautiful tree at the entrance to Eastman. When you're going in, it's on the left-hand side. Uh, and I don't know if you know the story of the tree, but basically, in my mind, it's the Sutherland tree. Uh, and uh, George and Jeannie had this tree in their yard. Uh, they had planted it. The tree got too big. Um, and uh, George decided that it, it had to be replaced. It had to be repotted, replanted. And so he hired uh, someone who was specialized in this, a forester of some kind. And um, George came to me, I think I was then the, the president of the board, and he said, we'd like to donate this tree to the community. And uh, I said, I'm sure we can organize that. It turned out to be a little bit more complicated, as it always does in a community association, but we organized it. And uh, that tree is there today, and in keeping with Sutherland tradition, there is no mention of the Sutherland name. There's a little sign uh, that says this tree is dedicated to Dudley Orr which is a name that probably doesn't mean much to most of you, but Dudley Orr was an attorney and one of the founders of Eastman. So in George's way, he used this tree to commemorate the founding of Eastman um, and refrain from putting his name or the family name on the tree. I'm sure this tree will continue to bloom for many years. The children agree that George was a person who cherished his friends and loved his family. I can think of no more fitting epitaph for this remarkable man. George was a wonderful listener. He paid attention to what you were saying and responded accordingly. In these times of division, in virtually every aspect of our lives, we need George and people like him to help guide us as we struggle to find answers to our most important questions. In Yiddish, the term mensch is usually reserved for someone very special. It's a very high compliment meant to be applied to someone who is a man of his word, a stand up guy person who has honor, trust, and integrity. One who we admire and want to emulate. A man with a sense of decency and dignity. George had all these qualities and more. I imagine George walking the roads of Eastman and thinking of the words Robert Frost, I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. <coughs> George Sutherland will be sorely missed, and we are all blessed to have had him.
thank uh, all of you for being here today. It means the world to my sisters and me that you're here to honor my dad and remember him. David, I want to thank you for that wonderful eulogy. Um, thank you for being such a true and trusted friend to my dad. I want to thank my sisters. sacrificed the blood, the sweat, the tears as they cared for my dad. Beth, you were there 24-7, and I know it wasn't always fun. But just thank you for loving him so well. I appreciate it. I, um, I've been thinking for quite some time about what I was going to say today once Julie, Beth, and I you know, saw Dad in his decline. He knew this day was going to come. Um, but it wasn't until, oh gosh, uh, just back in October when I was there to uh, be with Dad and my sisters just a week or so before he passed that um, it all kind of came to me. Uh, Julie and I were down in the basement of the house. We were just looking through things, you know, um, and came across a lot of papers that mom and dad had been saved and accumulated uh, over the years. And uh, some of it was absolute treasure. Letters they had written to each other. Letters that my dad had written to his parents from Germany when he was in, in the Korean War. Um, but at one point, Julie, um, she held out a birthday card and said, well, well this is something you get to dad that he, he saved. And she handed it over to me. I don't know if you can see this, but it's basically a cartoon cowboy riding on a cartoon horse. <laughs> and it says, dad, my hero. So I, I had no remembrance of this. and my, Looked at it, I figured, okay, this is probably something that my mom bought for me to give to dad. <laughs> and so when I opened it, I fully expected to see, just written in crayon, I love you, dad, with misspelled words and backward letters and maybe a, a stick figure or two holding hands. Um, but when I opened it, I saw that, wait a minute, that's, that's grown up writing. Um, <laughs> mom didn't buy this for me. <laughs> When I started to read it, I finally remembered uh, this card, and it, it, it just kind of sums up what I had wanted to say today. So I'm going to just read what I wrote in this card. Um, so here goes. Dear Dad, when I first saw this card, I thought it was silly, and I put it back on the shelf. After I walked around the store for a while, though, it suddenly hit me that this card wasn't so silly after all. You've proven to be my hero in many ways. Whether it be for physical, mental, financial, or emotional reasons, you've always been there to save the day. When I've gotten myself into trouble, when I've succeeded, when I've failed, when I've needed a kick in the pants, when I needed advice, or when I've just needed to go have a couple of beers and talk. You've always been there with love and understanding. The more often I see and observe other father and son relationships, the more I appreciate and value ours. I don't think our relationship is totally unique, but I do believe that it is truly rare. I'm lucky not only to have you as a father, but as a true friend as well. Much of the man I am today is because of you, Dad. <clears throat> I hope you are half as proud of this as I am. Thank you for always being there for me. I love you. And um, yeah, that really sums up what I wanted to say today. My dad um, was my best friend. He always has been and will continue to be my <laughs> hero. I've. Um, 
road for pretty much my entire adult life, trying to be every day more like him. Uh, but truth be told, I think the only thing I have over my dad is that um, I have better hair. <laughs> <laughs> sisters in me. I'm still in awe of the amazing way you love my mom. He, um, as Maynard said, um, he was a tremendous, tremendous listener. Um, you could go to him with uh, a problem, and he would hear you all the way through. He might ask a couple of questions about clarifying your, your points or your issue. But it also wasn't uncommon that he would say, okay, I'm going to think about this for a couple of days. Let's get back then, and we'll, we'll talk. And then he would give you his thoughts. He'd never really tell you what to do. But he would tell you a lot about what he thought. He um, was my greatest source of wisdom. I, uh, the first time I remember him imparting a life lesson or wisdom, I, I was probably only about uh, five or six years old, I guess, and I was, it was on a weekend, and I was going to uh, walk down the street to the bottom of Woods Road and see if I could find Eric Swanson or Michael Elwood. And the Swansons lived right at the end of the street, right as the cul-de-sac began. The Elwoods were right next door, so Michael and Eric always had the advantage of uh, seeing if one of the other was, was outside and could easily go out and play. Well, as I walk down the street, I see Eric and Michael, they're in the Elwood's front yard. And um, the Elwoods weren't long-term Woods Roadsers. They, they moved at some point. But uh, Eric and my cousin Bill were the two closest things I ever had to brothers. But anyway, I, I get down and I, I walk up to Mike's uh, front yard. And, and, Eric and Michael were in the middle of doing something. I don't can't remember what it was. But I'm like, hey guys, you know, what are you doing? And they just stop short, turn around. I'm like, well, um, we're already playing, so uh, you should come back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I turn around, put my hands in my pockets, hang my head, and walk back up past the White House house. Past the Brown's house, past the Smith's house, get to our house, and uh, you know, that's where he typically was on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. Well, probably Saturday, because Sunday he'd be watching football. But um, he's on the sofa in the den with his briefcase open, the papers all around. We've always brought work home with him. But I come in, and uh, he says, Hey, what's going on? Have you been down the street to play? I said, Well, Eric and Michael were already playing. They told me to come back tomorrow. So I, I don't, I don't think they like me. I don't think they want me to be their friend. And so he puts down his paper, and he scooches up on the front of the couch. So pulls me over. So we're just about eye to eye. He's sitting on the couch. I'm standing in front of him. He said, "You know, Len, you just you can't take one thing like that. It's that you know they don't want to be your friend or they don't like you." I understand, you know, it's, a, it's an awkward situation. It's not necessarily fair. But, you know, I learned something in my life a long time ago. It was probably a little bit older than you are now. But it's been very, very helpful to me. Whenever I come across a situation that is uncomfortable, awkward, or not fair, and uh, 
He said, so I want you to really listen to what I'm going to tell you here. He said, right? Are you paying attention? I said, yes, Dad. And he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, Glenn, pull my finger. <laughs> <laughs> it works to this day. <laughs> Just remember a good time with him. Keep him in your mind and in your heart for as long as you can. Um, I'm going to close by reading a poem that some of you may have heard, but it speaks to what I know my sisters and I are feeling today, which is love and loss. <clears throat> Poem is titled, Tis a Fearful Thing. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, to hope, to dream, to be. To be an old, to lose. A thing for fools, this, and a holy thing. A holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me. Your laugh once lifted me. Your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love. A holy thing to love what death has touched. Thank you again for being of being Georgia's granddaughter for the first 27 years of my life, and it's an honor that I'll carry with me for the rest of my years. I wanted to take a moment, as I stand here wearing my mother's, mother's ring, my dad's grandmother's ring, and oddly enough, a pair of my baby's socks that she made herself, <laughs> and just take a minute to think about how special the relationship between grandparents and grandchildren are. It's a relationship that can't really be found anywhere else, don't have any other relationships really like it. Um, and it's a relationship that my grandfather took very seriously. He took our laughter very seriously, our playfulness very seriously, our one-on-one -on -one time very seriously. Um, he made us all feel really special, met us where we were. He made sure that we all got his undivided attention multiple times a year. Any time he saw us, he would steal you away for a minute just between the two of you, make sure you felt heard, seen. He wanted to learn from you as much as we learned from him. Um, he loved us, and we loved him. And I found something that I wanted to read to all of you today to really show what kind of a grandfather he was, how much he loved us, and even though I just mentioned that he loved us all equally, this one just happens to be titled Alex and Isa. I miss them. Their trusting eyes, their uplifted faces, their constant exuberance. I miss them. I miss them. Their breakfast demands, the routines that are theirs, the things that they expect. I miss them. I miss them. Their laughter of joy, their absence of fear, their pleasure of the moment. I miss them. I miss them. The opening of a door in the morning, the knowing that they are with us, the extra dream that they bring. I miss them. I miss them. 
the jumping, the running, the queens and the princesses, the ever-changing island game. I miss them. I miss them this night, the first night that they are gone, the night that we won't read the story, the night that they are where they belong, but I miss them. And we miss Papa. For everything, its season, and a time for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. Here ends the reading. We will read portions of Psalm 90 responsibly, found in your order of worship. O oh Master, you have been our refuge in every generation. Before mountains were born, before you spawned earth and world, from forever to forever, you are God. You bring us back to dust and say, turn back, children of mortals. For a thousand years in your eyes are like yesterday gone, like a watch in the night. You give us away like a dream, like a grass that passes in the morning. In the morning it springs up and flowers. By evening it withers and dies. Our life comes to an end like a whisper. It is soon over, and we are gone. Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us with daybreak, with loving kindness, and that we may sing and rejoice all our days. Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, Set your troubled hearts at rest. Trust in God always. Trust also in me. There are many dwelling places in my Father's house. If it were not so, I should have told you. For I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also, and my way there is known to you. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Everyone who comes to the Father comes by me. Peace is my parting gift to you, my own peace such as the world cannot give. Set your troubled hearts at rest and banish your fears. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Look graciously upon us, O Holy Spirit, and give us for our hallowed thoughts that pass into Prayer, prayers that pass into love, and love that passes into life with thee forever. Amen. Well, what extraordinary tributes we have heard, and I do love the way you just let their words pass into the silence, but I think now we do want to show our appreciation 
for those three extraordinary <laughs> Really, there's not much more to be said, so I shall try to be brief. And I've got three passages of scripture that I could relate to George, but I was really struggling to capture this man. We all knew him, you know, just, I mean, the first word that came out of Maynard's mouth, a gentleman, a gentleman and a gentleman. A man who was just so wise. I used to so value um, my visits with George. I would just turn up, I didn't use to, to call, and I would always come away having learned a great deal from George. I did find, finally, a passage of scripture. We heard it in church this morning, twice. It's from the 85th Psalm, and George would love that you use the word bench, the Yiddish word, in regard to him. This passage, too, is from the Hebrew scriptures. It's from the 10th verse of Psalm 85. Mercy and truth have met together. Mercy and truth have met together. And how mercy and truth met together in George Sutherland. The Hebrew word for mercy is hesed. And it's about much more than an emotion, much more than a feeling. It always involves action. And again, the obituary said it all. George was some, a lover of life, of friends, of family and of God. And each of you will have known how George's loving kindness was manifest in action towards you. I know that he, I didn't realize he had so many large clubs. I know he had so many friends. My uh, high school classmate, John Bidwell, I know he's mates with his dad. I see Mr. Bidwell here. So many of you were friends of George and will know just what I'm talking about when I say that he embodied this Hebrew term, hesed, loving kindness, mercy, steadfast love. And truth, truth was so important to George, and the truth of the Christian faith he struggled with, right? He, one of the great things about George, he was so honest. Now here's a man who used to read the exams, not just read them, but used to mark the exams for priests or people hoping to be priests that have gone through three years of seminary, but they need to take the general ordination exams before they're ordained, unless the bishop makes an exception. And George used to get together with other lay people from throughout the country, but also many, many priests to read and evaluate these exams to decide which of these ordinands should go forth towards <coughs> ordination. He knew his theology. And his thinking about God has such a depth. But he struggled to connect the Jesus that we find in the Gospels and the Jesus of faith. And it's something we've talked a lot about. Well, as it happens, the Hebrew word translated truth in our prayer book is emet. And it's much about faithfulness and loyalty as it is about truth. And so George and I agreed that it was fine for him to be agnostic about a whole range of questions about doctrine. George understood that what is important at the end of the day is that we are faithful followers of God. And that in our Christian tradition, we have a wonderful example in Jesus who teaches us how to live and how to love. And so often, I saw George being able to be agnostic about, is Jesus God incarnate? Was Jesus born of a virgin? Did Jesus ascend into heaven? Is Jesus going to come again? But what he was absolutely sure of, that here was a life, that we can argue about how it's interpreted, but what Jesus wanted was for us to imitate his life. And George understood. Mercy and truth have met together, and how they met in George Sullivan. One last word about how those two met was, it's already been mentioned, the extraordinary love and devotion he and he had for each other. But especially at the end of the life, when things were difficult to see George's patience, I mean, that's what I saw, it might have been quite different at home, but to see George's patience with Jesus, to see him insisting on staying with her for hours at a time at 
the facility up in Hanover was quite extraordinary. And of course, Jeannie herself had so much to teach George. And so we gather here today to remember and to give thanks for the life of George Sutherland. George was not perfect, none of us is, but God in his mercy forgives us all. One of the things that George understood, that even death is powerless to separate us from the love of God. Love, God's love for us is utterly unshakable. And so today, as we bid farewell to George, as we acknowledge the sadness in our own hearts, the very real pain of loss and parting, and we at St. Andrews miss him. This is a man who contributed so much over the years to this church. I think he had most of the jobs that we offer. <laughs> His last one, you know, vestry, warden, probably treasurer. Yeah. But he, in the end, he chaired the uh, search committee that uh, Long co-chaired with Susan here. And there couldn't be two better people to introduce prospective rectors than to George Sutherland. Susan Schweitzer, and so I personally am grateful that I am here, largely because of George Sutherland and the committee that he chaired. And so as much as we miss George, we do well to remember that yes, he is gone from us, but he is now forever in God's keeping. May he rest in peace.
God the fountain of mercies and the giver of comfort. God of life, Lord of love, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, wept at the grave of his friend, Lazarus, and consoled Mary and Martha in their distress. In our loss, O oh God, we seek your presence. In our uncertainty, your love. Draw near to us who mourn for George, and comfort us in our sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, in your prayer. gracious God, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and might. We thank you for George, the years we shared with him, the good we saw in him, the love we received from him. Now give us grace to lead George in your care. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. God of all consolation, deal graciously with George's children in their grief. Comfort all his family and friends in their loss and sorrow. Be for us, O oh Lord, a sure hope and a strong refuge, and lift us from the depths of grief into the peace and light of your presence. Let faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O God of mercy and forgiveness, grant that death may be for George a gateway into everlasting life. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Carry him safely home into the blessed rest of eternal peace and into the glorious company of the saints in life. Lord, in your mercy, Hear bring us, O Lord, at our last awakening, into the house and gate of heaven, to enter into that gate and dwell in that house, where shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession. No ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity in the habitations of your glory and dominion, world without end. Amen. Amen. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer each other a gesture of
lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who rose victorious from the dead and comforts us with the blessed hope of everlasting life. For to your faithful people, O Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when our mortal bodies lie in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God our God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate for the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O oh Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming to glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O oh Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with Jeannie, George, Andrew, Blessed Mary, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to us from evil. For the Lord is the kingdom. Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The holy gifts of God for the holy people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. <clears throat>
Give rest, O Christ, to your servant George with your saints. Where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humankind, and we are mortal formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust. Yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. George, go forth from this world in the love of God the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus Christ who redeemed you, in the power of the Holy Spirit who sustains you. God, our Creator and Redeemer, gather George to yourself. Uphold him with your strength, and fold him with your love. Embrace him with the arms of your mercy, and keep him ever close through the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, having done all we can for George, we pause to pray for ourselves. This service will conclude with God's blessing. The cross will lead uh, close family and close friends to the Kelsey Memorial Garden behind church for a very brief final part of our service, the committal. And we shall join you in a matter of penance in the parish hall for the reception. Lord God, you brought us to birth, and in your arms we die. Keep us mindful that life is short and the hour of death unknown. Let your spirit guide our days on earth in the ways of holiness and justice, that we may serve you sure in faith, strong in hope, perfected in love. And when our earthly journey is ended, lead us with George into your heavenly dwelling place, where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May Christ, the Good Shepherd, give to you and to all those whom you love his comfort and his joy, his light and his peace in this world and the next. And the blessing of God all to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.